You're listening to the world's smartest podcast network. Welcome back to Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones-Roy. We're continuing to major in, I don't know, everything. I'm super excited about today's guest. He is a friend of mine from the comedy scene, but as we'll discuss, has been a part of many other scenes that may or may not be particularly related to comedy and are scenes that I have either fancied myself as part of or have been interested in and so on. Uh, So super excited to have him talk with us. He's joining us from the big wide world of Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome to the show, Zane Sharif. Hooray. What's up? What's up? Thanks, thanks for offering some regional diversity. We have a yeah. lot of uh, New York City people on this yeah, show. Yeah, well, so, somebody's got to represent the voice of the South, yes. right? Yes. Georgia, Florida, this Indian guy's got it. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. I mostly have you here to talk about Southern pride. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those of you listening to the audio, there are a couple of really big Confederate flags uh, right behind Zane. So. Yeah, and there's a big banner that says COVID isn't real. Right, it's right, huge. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're just going to call this episode like hashtag wake up sheeple or something like that. And that's yeah, perfect. So so Zane's going to talk about his, uh, you know, his work on January 6th yeah. and the Trump rallies. <laughs> that's perfect. Um, Actually, if you maybe you should hold this away. It's sort of like crinkling a yeah. tiny bit. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. If you don't mind. So of course, that. of course. Cool. So Zane, welcome to the show. I know you, as I said in the intro from comedy. Right. And I know that you have. uh consulting experience and corporate experience a because i think we've talked about it at the lantern you know before after shows and complained about that stuff and you also have what i consider to be the world's greatest joke ever about consulting and we don't need to spoil the punchline here i can point people to your instagram post about it or if it's on tiktok or whatever yeah sure but but my understanding is you were a quote real person for a while in the corporate world yeah now you do comedy pretty much full time have i got that right (laughs) Well, the, the difference is that the the comedy uh, income or the comedy share of my income has increased over time, but I'm still doing consulting. Are you? So I've never know. not had a, a day job after graduating uh, from grad school. And it's always been in consulting. Um, so before in 2021, I switched between consulting firms and I went to like a much smaller firm, okay. but kind of in the same world of, of telecom and uh, software and digital technology. Okay. And so what kind of, are you allowed to say, do you like consulting? I do. I am allowed to say, um, I'm not allowed to like disclose the projects and stuff, but, uh, in terms of like, that'll be for our Patreon. Don't worry. Yeah. 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 $6 a month. And you get to know all my clients. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I I mean, I do like consulting. I, I think it's fun and not to get like too, um, not to get too like, trying to draw lines where they're not there, but I do kind of think about it. Like I think about comedy because when I'm, you know, a lot of times in consulting, they have this phrase that is uh, tell the story or what's the story, which I think is complete bullshit. But what they're trying to say when they simplify something that's very complicated into tell a story is that when you're trying to present a case to an argument, you're presenting like a, a uh, set of logical steps that can convince someone of something. In consulting, I've always found that to be research-based or factual or something that's rooted in, you know, like a technical set of skills. In comedy, it's just humor. But in terms of like constructing a logical argument where people can follow and at the end they go, oh, I understood everything you said and I agree or I disagree. I mean, those are kind of the same set of skills to me. And that's why I've always liked it. It's just, I can't be funny, but it's the same, like you're trying to do the same thing, you know, like in stand up, if I have like a premise, so, I'll, okay. So I'll give you this like risky premise that I'm trying out. Great. And it's like this idea that I have a lot of friends who are very vegan and very liberal, and that's a common intersection is that they're very liberal, very vegan. And one day I was at brunch with a very liberal, very vegan friend. And I was eating an omelet and she said, I don't know how you can do that. And I said, why? And she said, those are eggs that those are that chicken's baby. That's life. You're eating life. And it's like, wait, aren't you pro choice? Like, don't it it shouldn't it be the same? And then it goes into like a more abstract set. But like to present that initial argument is asking quite a bit of the audience. Yeah. So whatever that setup is, has to be so clear and so stepwise that nobody's like confused or else you'll bomb. 
And in consulting, it's the same thing. Like that setup is so critical to establishing the final point that yes, you shouldn't invest $200 million in this little startup or not. Right. Right. But if I'm not clear with it, I'm screwed, you know? Right. Yeah. You should invest $200 million and, or recognize your own hypocrisy you dumb vegans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I want to say for the record to our listeners, uh, that was not me, the vegan liberal that he was having brunch with, though it no, might no. as well have been. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> even as you said it, I was like, oh, he's about to make a really good point that I'm not going to like. It's fine. I get it. I mean, I know yeah. they weren't fertilized eggs, but all right. Yes, exactly. That is the yeah. counter argument. Yeah, that's the counter argument. Yeah. So it sounds like your vegan friend was just dumb, which is yeah, mainly exactly. what I wanted to talk to you. about. Exactly. Exactly. These dumb vegans making the rest of us look bad. So, OK, so you. Can you be funny when you do consulting presentations? Because a lot of people will talk about how injecting humor makes people understand and open up to you. Do you ever try to do that or are you keeping it keeping it straight? I definitely try to. I think there's more of a scope for it, like with your internal teams. So if I have a group of, of guys and girls that I'm working with day to day and like I'm handling the research and analysis, somebody's handling the modeling, another is the project manager and somebody's the principal just managing the relationship. It's like if we're meeting every other day and talking and hanging out, I can make jokes like I can make topical jokes or political jokes or like, you know, not political in the sense where you're like making a stand. But I mean, right. like, hey, this happened in the news. Isn't this crazy? Or like whatever, whatever it is, you, you start to have that. But it is really hard to pull it off, in my opinion, from uh, like w- when you're trying to establish a relationship with a client because I have seen it go bad. Like you just kind of have to read the room just like stand up, but you do get the vibe that like, if you're sitting down with this, you know, this guy who represents this like huge bank, the dude doesn't have time to like mess around. Right. Like you kind of get that vibe right off the bat and you're like, okay, this is strictly business. I have 20 minutes of FaceTime with this guy I'm not going to make a joke about how I slipped getting into the turnstiles of this bank's building. Right. Like he, he doesn't give a shit, you know, even if you did. And even if it was hilarious. Yeah. That's something yeah. that I just keep in my pocket and I use that on stage, Right. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is, that's the fun part is like, okay, this is like, I might be getting like too um, abstract about it, but my belief is that. So for example, the day job or all the things that you do, right. I think that comedy should be informed by things that are not comedy. And I think that to inform comedy, you have to do those things. And for me, what that has meant is like stability, which to me has been linked to a stable income or a position where I can, where I can kind of apply myself mentally um, daily in a non-funny way. Mm. And then I get to be like, okay, what in my daily experiences can inform the funny? And in reality, if I were just sitting in the funny all day, I think I'd be less funny. Mm. But that's just my like hypothesis. Like I was raised as like a good kid, straight A student, Indian boy who was going to be a doctor. So it's like that, that, that area is where I live. And the comedy is where my passion is. But I think if you ripped that away from me, I I don't really know. Like, could I just sit around and just walk in the park and write jokes about trees and ketchup? I I don't think I could because everything's coming from my point of view. Or else you just if you if you rip all those aspects around you that make you not just a comedian, then it's like, what are you what are you telling jokes about? You're telling jokes about being at the airport and the and the last show you did. And, you know, like. Which what we've audience all seen cares. Yeah. A lot of that. Yeah. They don't care. You know, they don't yeah. care what you're the worst time you bombed and you yeah. do an eight minute bit about that. That's just too meta. They want to yeah. hear you be like, hey, my day job is in consulting. And like, you know, it's just kind of smoke and mirrors, which is a joke. But it's like, yeah, that's something because there are consultants sitting right there. Yeah. And then they start cheering and going, you know, or like the the vegan thing. It's like. I was actually having brunch with that person. And that person I met outside of comedy and the conversations I have with that person are conversations that have nothing to do with comedy. Right. And that's when I can like think like, oh, this will be used on stage. Like this is going to be good here. And, you know. Right. But but that's just my, you know, we're, we were joking about Joe Rogan before this started. But like 
Rogan is like one of those examples of these kind of, you know, I'm not interested in anything he's interested in, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm just not into hunting and, you know, whatever. But and eating, I don't know, elk, deer antlers or whatever. Meat, yeah. <laughs> deer antlers, just <laughs> biting off deer antlers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, or, or like the MMA stuff, right? So right. Joe Rogan's an example of these kind of like Renaissance men and women who are kind of coming into comedy. And I just love that trend. Like, I think it's so mm. cool um, to see them, to see so many multifaceted kind of funny people. This is the first time in my life I've seriously thought, I wonder if I could get Joe Rogan on my podcast because oh, yeah. I had not thought of him that way. I am as the vegan liberal over here in New York City. Yeah. I just hear the name Joe Rogan and think, well, he's bad. So I have no idea. Maybe I should right, bring right. him on. Uh, I never would have <laughs> even given him the credit of Renaissance person, but you're right. You're right. He totally is. So I'm so thrilled to hear you say this because and I'm curious if you felt the same. There's so much pressure, at least in the New York comedy scene, but really in probably any comedy scene of people who take themselves seriously as comedians and whose goal it is to be a full time comedian. Right. The, the idea here in New York, and I even started this conversation with that assumption about you, because I see you as a hardworking comedian, that the only way to be a comedian is to be only a comedian. And there's a lot of, you know, arms races and chest pounding and self-promotion on Instagram about how you're doing nothing but writing, sh you know, doing shows and writing New shows. Yeah. And the big thing to do is to quit your day job and go all in. And that's how you like do it. Yeah, that's how you do it. And so it makes me feel better and like less of a sellout because I also haven't quit my day job. Right. I, I, I mean, a lot of my comedian friends have day jobs and they're and they're pretty funny. Um, I think that that like uh, it, it's kind of like a Carlin-esque romantic view of comedy, which is just like burn everything and reconstruct. And, and, I, and I do think that's beautiful. I mean, a lot of my heroes have followed that path, you know, like um, comedians that I that have been in the game for so long, like uh, like Louis C.K., Bill Burr, Sarah Silverman, like these comics who kind of started in that class. I unless I'm completely mistaken, they don't come from massive amounts of wealth where they could just hang out, which is, you know, you kind of see that a lot in New York nowadays, where it's very uh, privileged people who kind of just like hang out and do stand up. And so they get that opportunity to reconstruct without much risk. Um, but then there's the the other view, which is like burn everything, live in live in kind of this uh stressful financial and emotional environment and that's where the art is born yeah Th those are really two things that i see quite a bit of i would like to be to land in the middle where i'm like self-sustaining i'm not worried i um get to exercise these other strengths that i have but it, and again in my people might completely disagree with me and if i never become famous it's probably let's say it's because of this right well, because now I'm we not, know we at least because know. i'm not willing to let go of this kind of like antiquated view that like i have to be a productive member of society in order to be an artist mm. but um i just think one that that's where the art comes from uh but also it's like do you really want to set yourself like do you want to play such a high risk game do you want to play such a high risk game and for a lot of people their personalities work in that high risk game but i i don't know if i can work in that high risk game you know like it, it's just an evaluation that you have to make the other point that i make about it about stand up specifically is stand up really is a 6 to 12 job it is a mm -hmm. 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. job. Yep. I, I don't know any shows that start past 6 p.m. So that means the time before that is mine. And if I'm working from home in a consulting gig and I can be efficient and I can really work nine to five or nine to four if I'm really quick, and then I go work out for an hour and then I poorly, by the way, not, not burning <laughs> much, but right, work right. out for an hour. Just my point being that you do something for your mental health. You do something to just stay calm and sane between those things. And then right. you make that transition from six to 12. And now you're just, your stand-up brain is on. You're right. going stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. That is emotionally exhausting. It mm -hmm. eats away a lot of your time, but that is a way to do it. Yeah. You know, that's a way to do it. 
without sacrificing your artistic growth, as long as you can plug in, you know, all day. Right. And that comes to that comes back to like that thing that I was talking about with like while I'm consulting or while I'm doing my day job, there is also a secondary like track that is evaluating all my scenarios from a comedic perspective. Mm. It's just kind of humming in the background. You know, mm -hmm. I think um, I can't remember who it was, but it was it was a Ron Funches was talking about how like a lot of comics, they have this view of hunting for material or hunting for their jokes or their premises or whatever. And he's like, I'm just fishing, mm. which I really, really liked. Like, cause if I was ready for you to say gathering, but fishing. Okay. Gathering, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he's saying like fishing, which is just, he's living a, an, a, a, uh, a life that is highly observed. You know, he's very conscious of what he's feeling and experiencing day to day. And then the, the line in the water is just always there. And when Who something what, bites, yeah. he just, that's his joke. And yeah. like that, that philosophy is really beautiful to me because it means that you can do the consulting or the dancing, or if you're Joe Rogan, you know, go and do an MMA, whatever, like right. watch somebody beat the shit out of somebody else. You, right, know, right, you, right. Can, you can do those things. Maybe that's what we both need to be doing for our comedy <laughs> careers. Watching, watching extreme violence on a day-to-day <laughs> yeah. -day basis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that might be the ticket. That might be it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, I did not expect you to say all these things that would make me feel so much better. Uh, we should have these conversations more often, but uh, it's, it's consistent with a hypothesis that I've had in my head, but can't quite give myself permission to believe, which is this idea that our talents and our skills and our time, maybe, maybe not time, is, is non-zero sum, which is to say that the right. more time I spend on something doesn't necessarily mean I'm deleting that amount of time from something else. And maybe in a mathematical sense, if I spend an hour on this, I'm not spending an hour on that. But right. what you're describing is I can spend an hour on consulting, looking at a spreadsheet, being on a Zoom call, interacting with colleagues, presenting, and in the background, I have this material I'm fishing, right? Right. And so and it isn't. I, and I think they the have other. a. I think they have a compounding effect. Mm -hmm. Like I think the fact that I do stand up makes me better at consulting Ooh, because tell me. I can interact with people and I can connect with people and I can like reading the room. It's not like I'm. It's not like I know how to read a room naturally in both situations. When I'm when I, if I have to sit down with the big investor guy or girl, that, like I'm reading him or her as a result of my experience reading t dozens of strangers every single night. So all I'm doing is I'm just applying that. And comedy too is like, it's like a scale where there, there is like a complete joke that you can pitch out. I can sit in a consulting meeting and tell a joke. I yeah. wouldn't do that. That's stupid. But <laughs> comedy is this scale where there is this like you know, one or two level right here out of 10, where you're just being funny, you're injecting humor, right? But it's yeah. like, to know that this is the kind of humor that's appropriate here, and this will land, is a result of doing stand up every night, right? And, and not just making people laugh, I think making people laugh is diluting it to its like, core component, which is laughter. But yeah. in reality, it's just like, to me, it is uh, the ability to connect with people, you know, like comedy, somebody described this like old view of comedy as like, you are the, you are speaking in front of the village. You are making a case in front of the village, like mm -hmm. in, in its, in its oldest historical sense. And so that's why people have stage fright is because they're making a case. Like, this is why you should listen to me. And, uh, I've heard somebody else equate another comic equate it to like, being the tribal leader. Like, why, why do you get to speak to the tribe? Right. And when the audience determines that you are not qualified to speak to the tribe, that's called bombing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I and felt it physically. I was like, I've been there. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I will say, and, and like, this is not to knock, because I'm sure people who listen to this, they don't agree with that. And they do want to go full you know, jump with both feet into the artistic venue. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's really beautiful too. You know, like I, I'm projecting because I moved out of New York in the pandemic and I relocated back home to Atlanta. Um, and I had to do a lot of like math, which was, am I going to get time? Am I going to grow and develop? 
is my artistic passion just going to fall by the wayside because I'm not in the capital. I'm not in the Mecca, no pun intended, but I'm yeah. not in, not, not pun, but no, no Muslim reference intended, right. but I'm not in like the Mecca of where that occurs, which is to say that if you do do that jump with both feet strategy and you are in New York City and all your colleagues are jump with both feet strategy and you all are talented and across the street, there's Mark Norman and there's Sam Morrill and there's Joe List and there's these superstars who have yeah. who have gone through the same path. And guess what? You're on the same lineup. You know, Norman has, is, and Morrill drop in to the yeah. lantern and do a set before they go to the cellar. It's like that culture of observing and um, consuming like in real time with people who are deeply talented in that full risk environment definitely creates amazing right. art and amazing comedians, right? Hey everyone, AJR here, interrupting my own podcast with an exciting announcement. As many of you know, I do a bunch of different stuff, which is one of the reasons I do this show. And one of those things is teach data science at NYU and to corporations and all kinds of people who want to know more about data science. And one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of people who are not involved in data science think, oh, 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 I could never do that when I mention data science. And I think that's a shame because data science is fun and everyone can get involved. And if everyone does get involved, we could potentially save the world. So I'm putting on a show. It's called the Data Science Spectacular, and it's at Caveat Theater in New York City and live streaming all over the world on Tuesday, March 1st at 7 p.m. You can get tickets for the in-person or live stream at caveat.nyc, www.caveat.nyc, or at my uh, Instagram or Twitter, at jonesroy, J-O-N-E-S-R-O-O-Y. And come to the Data Science Spectacular. There will be comedy, there will be circus, and you will learn how, what the heck is going on in data science and how to get involved. It'll be fun, I think. See you there. For me, the math that I did to move out of New York was at some point I had, I had observed those comedians and I felt that I was just playing a game with myself, hmm. like my internal growth as a, as a, as an artist uh, was some, was an equation just with myself. Meaning today I killed this hard tomorrow. I should try to kill this hard today. I wrote this much or this week I wrote this much tomorrow. I should write that much. I think if you're self-aware enough to be like, this is not good and I need to do better. Like pummeling yourself is something that can happen here. And I don't think it is restricted to a geographic location. I don't think it's restricted to the people around you. That is just a game you're playing with yourself. The question is like, how much, how much uh, greatness or how much like um, artistic skill do you demand of yourself? And to me, whether you have a day job, whether in New, you're in New York, whether mm. you're colleagues are really good whether you see really good art it doesn't matter right. all that matters is like if you can play the game up here right uh but that doesn't again that doesn't yeah. work for anybody this right. is not functional advice for anybody except for really just me yeah you know yeah. This, <laughs> that's you, perfect because this podcast is only for you so uh <laughs> it's well, kind of weird what, to tell you that yeah. now but but i've that's been doing also it also how i've geared my stand-up is is uh it's only it's only about me yeah. It's for me. If you'd like to buy in, I'd, I'd appreciate that. But yeah. this yeah. is going to happen uh, this way. And it's going to be fully self-centered, whether whether you like it or not, you know? Well, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I have gone through phases as you were describing this, you know, what is it that I'm going to talk about on stage? Catch up and trees or whatever. Yeah. And first of all, I immediately thought of Tompkins Square Park when you said that. And I was like, I think it's filled with ketchup. There's no yeah. way. There's oh, no, no doubt. For, oh, for sure. At best. <laughs> Oh, for sure. Best case there's scenario. Some, there's some it's hot ketchup. sauce under those benches, for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I have many times in my own material thought, gosh, Andrea, wouldn't it be amazing if you could talk about anything other than yourself on stage? Yeah. And I'll sit and I'll think and I'll be like, politics, weather. Like, I don't know. I don't have anything interesting to say yeah. that isn't the same crap that we're all saying on Twitter yeah. anyway. Or I think I should talk less about being a professor, but... 
I don't know. I don't see any other comedians talking about being a professor. And for you, I don't see other comedians talking about consulting. And I find it super interesting because yeah. I've been there and I connect with that. And so it it's I see what you're saying, that it's not like there's a one size fits all. And if going all in and swimming in the sea of comedy only works for you, then great. Yeah. But I love what you've described of saying, like, look, you can be in the game in the way that suits you best. And being in the game is not the same thing as being in New York City as writing all day and then being up till four in the morning, hanging out with other comics or yeah. whatever. Right. Like there's more than one path to excellence. And I think it's and I don't think that's unique to comedy. There's this idea when I was in grad school, the idea of being the lone you know, genius in the ivory tower who does nothing but obsesses over their latest theory and hypothesis and does their work and never does anything else. Yeah. It was the exact same thing. Like the temptation is to cut out everything else in your life because it's a distraction and go all in on a, a thing. Right. Right. I don't know how much of that is that like, I think we're similar in age. I think I'm a bit older than you. Like how much of that is just some millennial crap? Like has Gen Z gotten past all this or, or. Well, in terms of their relationship to, to pursuing some sort of art, well, and this idea that that even if it's not art, that to do well, you have to kind of kill yourself and only think about that thing. I see that with yeah. my friends who are lawyers, who are in tech, who are yeah. actors, you know, like the goal is to quit everything else and just zoom in on your, quote, passion. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the, the millennials that I grew up with or the friend circle that so I grew up, I was born in 94 and like okay. that, that. So you're a lot bit younger than I am. Cool. I am. OK, I <laughs> yeah. look older than you. So there you go. But, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I have but, so many heavy Zoom filters on right now. It's, I'm actually <laughs> 70. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like I, I think so. This is kind of like goes back to my background. I thought I was going to be a doctor until I was like 19 or something, 20. Wow. Um, and I was like preparing for med school. And I think there, there are a few comics that we know who have kind of a similar story. But the the collegiate environment even the high school environment even the middle school environment or or you know that I kind of came up in part of it being uh pretty culturally Indian part of it being the child of immigrants um part of it just connecting with like-minded people and part of it being blessed enough to be good at school right because a, a lot of people are not blessed enough to be good at school like a, a lot of people that I know um, it, it just didn't work for them. Mm. For me and for the friends that I surrounded myself with, it worked for us. And so we were all like trying to get really high SAT scores and taking as many AP classes as we could. And in college, we were all trying to be doctors and lawyers. And so that was the environment in the sense that it was like, this is your work be passionate about mm -hmm. your work D emotionally um uh give yourself to your work your work is the most important thing in your life and i still believe that mm. i still believe that the difference is that i took that love and i actually in my view i bifurcated those into art and something corporate and so i do have that passion for my corporate gig. And I do have that passion for my art. At some point I was like, who's trying to tell me that that has to be doctor or, yeah. or, or lawyer who made the rules. It could be four different things that I put my passion into, but I still believe to this day, even though I'm doing both the things is that like, if you're not putting 110% of yourself into your work, meaning what, whatever you create, like whether that is the new joke and that's all you're doing or you're doing consulting or you're doing law or you're a lawyer and then you're like a dancer at night, you know, those are all things that you're creating into the world. You're putting them out into the world. Some may be drier than others. Some may be less or more artistic, but if you're not maximizing the input into those things, I believe you're leading kind of an unfulfilled life. Mm. Like I still, I still come from that culture of like, if you're going to do it, you better care a lot about it and you better work hard at it or else just give up, right. you know, give up. Right. Um, and that's what I tell most comedians that I meet younger comedians. I say, just give up. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's no room yeah. on the stage for both of us. Yeah, so. no, no, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But what but yeah. what I what I am kind of getting at is like um, there's this like uh, Mitzi Shore quote that is uh, it's she said something like reinforcing mediocrity or supporting mediocrity is a sin. Ooh. And so it's like, I don't think mediocrity comes from a lack of talent or a lack or a lack of having a gift to do something, whether that's dancing or acting. Those things are inborn. They cannot be controlled. You can work to accelerate those. But I think mediocrity comes from like not caring. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of artists and I do. Uh, and I saw them in New York and I see them in Atlanta and I, and they're not maybe just restricted to comedy and, and, and they're not even just artists. They could be professionals, but they're just kind of like drifting through, you know, they're drifting through. It's like the bare minimum. You can see emotionally, they're kind of checked out. Yeah. They're not deeply passionate about what they're doing and they're doing just enough to get by. Yep. They're doing just enough to get three or four shows a month. They're doing just enough to like, stay employed uh at the level that they're employed there, there is no um culture of like self-improvement and self-analysis and pummeling yourself to get the best out of you and it's like when i meet those people i my my uh intrusive thought is like if you were being a real friend you would tell them that they either need to care mm. or they should quit yeah and I, I genuinely feel that when I see somebody who's just like, you know, it, it, it applies in comedy. You, you'll meet like negative people. Yeah. You'll meet people who are like, they've kind of, um, they've kind of concluded that they're not really going anywhere or like that they're not good or that they don't want to get better. Or like, you just kind of get this vibe of this emotional stagnation. Like the and scene just, sucks. I suck. I saw this, this is, is the life I'm in. Like, or, or, look at or, us. You, or, or it manifests itself a lot in like, this person got this. Uh, Why did I not get this? Uh, that like fixation of like, I only got 12 spots. This guy's getting 15 spots. Right. Or, or like Comedy Central came around. Comedy Central gave show. Comedy Central gave a showcase to her. And yeah. not to me, it's like, bro, you're already operating in the wrong mental zone. Yeah. Like you should quit. Yeah. Unless, unless you're, unless you're, I feel you're, very spoken to, by the way, I was yeah. like, first of all, I think I'm guilty of a lot of these things and you're me being too. a good oh, friend me too, by me saying too. this. Me so, too. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Really? I was just going to ask how you have, like, you must have so much self-discipline or confidence or, or something to. Well, I, I have felt that I, you know, I, I felt that a lot when I was a younger comic. And I think it happens a lot when you're first starting out, which is like the comic who has two years of experience is like this guy. <laughs> this guy blows. Huh? <laughs> I could get up there and kill. And yeah. it's like, you can't, right. Yeah. That is the delusion. Um, and the, the, the delusional confidence that yeah. you need to do comedy. You need that to do comedy. It's a or special you, time. Yeah. yeah or else you, it, it is a beautiful time, <laughs> yeah. but I'm talking about people who are in the game yeah. and they haven't like broken yet. Yeah. Right. And they're in this like weird part where they start to become fixated on the status of other mm -hmm. comedians or where certain opportunities are coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think I was guilty of that when I first moved to New York. Like I just had this view of like, um, I need to get everything, uh, you know, I, I agent comedy central yep. late night that needs to happen by 2020 yep. or else what am I doing? You know? Yeah. And like, that is a very type a thing, you know? Yep. Um, and then somewhere down the line, part of it became because I was actually, I, I felt in my heart and soul that I was getting better, mm. you know, and I was improving and I was getting really funny and I was putting stuff online. A lot of our close friends have started blowing up online post COVID many of them, yep. you know? And it's like, when you get that validation, maybe it's coming from Instagram reels, or maybe it's coming from TikTok or wherever it's coming from. Yeah. The validation that you're getting better, that process is the, the destination, I think, you know, and people who are, who became, fi who become fixated on the outcomes and uh, the status and the hierarchy, it's like, oh, you've fallen out of love with the process 
And now all that energy that maybe you could have put into creating something pure, you're instead, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're putting yourself up against what somebody else got right. or what somebody else did. You're like living in the world of the scoreboard, not the, like, what are you even doing? And that's Basically. just self-destructive, you know, yeah. the, 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 I think, so if you're caring about the process, that's one thing, but I, I have met a lot of people also who are kind of like, they're not delusional. They're, they're kind of delusional. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think I may. Yeah, go on. Like people who, and this is in all aspects of life. Yeah. Uh, it has not just with comedy. I felt this when I was like dancing. I felt, you know, there are these people who are like, who, who would say what I just said. Like, dude, people just, they care about the scoreboard and they care about like who's who and what's what. And it's like, you got to focus on the art. And then you like watch them. And then they like get off stage and they're like, crushed and it's like <laughs> yep. you didn't dude you yeah. didn't so if you care about like if, if you're one of these people who tries to focus on the process as much as possible you also have to be brutally self-aware yeah. and brutally honest like I, I maybe to a fault am really brutal with myself mm. like uh in the sense of like you you thought this was good and mm -hmm. it was horrible What's like, how could you miscalculate so much? Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think the nirvana of comedy, this is what somebody told me. And I think it applies to a lot of things. And I think about it all the time. Every time I have a bad set or a set that I don't, I didn't think went as good as it should. I, I told this comic after I don't do well, I like kind of don't like myself a little mm. bit. You know, like not, not in the sense where I don't think I'm a good comedian or I don't think I'm good at what I do, but I'm just like disappointed in myself. Mm. I'm very disappointed in myself. And I kind of wear that disappointment for the next day or for the next few hours. When I, when I was in New York, I would wear it for a week. Mm. And that's pretty bad. Like, I don't think you're supposed to do that. And I was talking to him about it and he was an older comic and he was like, the, this is your own journey. This is your own development in stand-up. And you know you've reached a point of emotional growth when you can have a not-so-great set and you can tell yourself, I had a not-so-great set. What do I need to do to make it better? And you make that progress and you make those changes without bringing your emotional frequency into the situation. You just, like, like kind of a machine, you just recalibrate and adjust your algorithm for next time. Right. But you don't go, oh, what am I doing? I suck, okay? Right. And I go, that's awesome. And he goes, but let me tell you what the flip side is. Uh -oh. And I said, what? And he goes, when you kill, when you kill, and you have one of those sets that you're like, I am it. He's like, that should also be operating from a place of emotional neutrality. Yeah. And I was like, dude, that's where I want to get. Yeah. I want to get to like emotional neutrality and, mm. and, and progress, you yeah. know, cause that's, I think that is that like zone of, of maximum return where you're not like, you're not obsessed with your own emotional state and you're also taking these huge leaps forward. But I think that's really hard to get to. I think I'm far away from it. I still get caught up in like, there's a dude, this guy got stand up NBC. Yeah, I want to get stand up NBC, and then you're just like, "What am I even doing right now?" I need now? more TikTok followers. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Dude, uh, Nick got a hundred thousand TikTok followers. Yeah, you know? it's just like, well, I don't have that many TikTok followers. Am I not putting out the right content? It's like, dude, right, right. What are you doing? Yeah, I need more shorter videos with punchier, what, yeah, whatever. So, what you're describing sounds like the comedy version of like, I'm not a fitness person, but like Orange Theory or meditation, right? Where it's like, you want to get or flow state or whatever, right? Flow you're state, on stage yeah. and you're not emotionally wound up one way or the other. And you're producing what, 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 what does it feel like? Especially for folks who are not comedians, like what is it about maybe comedy in particular that you're trying to, you would want to experience every time you're on stage? Oh, right. Um, right. Like if you're there not feeling ecstatic and you don't hate yourself, like yeah. What is there? <laughs> there? Exactly. 
Well, there was a like, I can't remember who coined it, but it was some comic. I think the phrase was like, well, okay. So you're talking about how I feel emotionally, how I, with the emotional state I'm supposed to be in. Well, or what you would consider, a, like, what, what does achievement look like to you or getting to that state? What would that feel like for you? Or what does it feel like if you ever tap into it? Oh, yeah. I think it would just be like this very, I know this sounds like kind of psychotic, but it would be this very like clinical mm. view of how I did. And like, I've started trying to coach myself into that, which is basically I'll do 20 minutes or whatever. And since I've moved here, I've, I've been like trying to seek out these longer sets. Cause I think that flow state is really established in large amounts of time. And so I try to stay with that audience and I try to take as many calculated risks as I can. So the higher the risk, the happier I am with the output. Uh, and by risk, I just mean new jokes, like, or new tags. So I'm trying to maximize that risk without sacrificing a good set. Because mm -hmm. at some point, your risk is so high that like, you're, you're bordering on bombing now, right. and, and you need to like readjust the set. So I try to maximize that risk. And then to, to kind of coach myself into that non emotional state, as soon as I get off stage, I run away somewhere else and I'm completely alone. Like mm. I can't talk to my girlfriend or my brother or my friends. And I sit with my notebook. And before I had done the 20 minutes or whatever, I wrote down every single thing I wanted to try, all the um, risks that I wanted to take. And I write little notes like this did well. This was really bad. This tag needs work. Mm. And almost like I'm back in school, like grading myself. And then I just think about all the things that went poorly and all the things that went well. And I just make a plan of how to improve them. And sometimes what I notice is like, I don't like to bring notes on stage because I'm just like, I feel like it breaks that, that flow state, but I'll notice that like, I have 20 minutes and that's maybe, I don't know, 17 jokes and like, or 15 jokes and like three stories, let's say. And I will, I have skipped over some stuff in, in the, in the, in the set. And I make note of that. I go, Oh, I didn't tell that joke. I didn't tell that joke. And I realized when that happened, like what happened there was I reverted back to this like very defensive state where I knew I should be telling that joke because I had planned to tell that joke, but I didn't want to feel that risk. Like I didn't want to feel that danger in front of the tribe. Mm -hmm. So I just went back to the tribe with what I knew. Right. And it's like, I made that decision and probably for the night, I had a better set because yep. I didn't take that risk. But guess what? I didn't get better. Yep. I didn't get better. And like, that's the price I paid for having a slightly better set. Mm -hmm. I paid the price of my future self. Like I told tomorrow's comedian, hey, I'm sorry, yep. but I had to take something away from you because I was scared. Yep. And it's like, I don't want to be scared. I don't want to be happy. I don't want to like, you know, if, if you leave a set and somebody's like, dude, that was, you know, a common compliment that like I give comics or comics will give each other is like, let you leveled up, mm. which means like I've seen, I'm watching you operate in a different mental and emotional state. You're one level higher. And what, what I think that means is that you took those risks and they paid off. Like you're, you're operating as a better comedian and like I think in order to level up you just have to like kind of stab yourself a little bit um and I think that's where the emotional pain comes mm -hmm. from I don't think it comes from like being hungry mm -hmm. I think it comes from like being deeply uncomfortable um it's like uh Louis CK who <laughs> a comic a comic talked about him uh right after like the scandal and he, he was in Brooklyn and he was like Louis CK used to say and, and and I know he's dead now but may he rest in peace and like he yeah. kept doing the joke yeah <laughs> but Louis CK in in one of his like talks was talking about how like he would take his closer and start opening with it mm. because he's like now I'm kind of screwed 
So whatever used to be my second to best bit, like Mm. I better make that my best bit. And he's doing that in real time. I mean, what's a more, what's a more severe risk than playing with your closer? Yeah. Your closer is like your, it's like your bedrock, you know, your opener and your closer are your bedrock. So if you turn your opener into the greatest thing, and now your closer's got to meet up to that. And you don't know if you can pull that off. I mean, if we're talking about risk, what's yeah. riskier than that? It's like, I'm going to jump out of the plane and wait a little bit longer before I open the parachute than I did exactly. the day before. And, that's, and that is the fear that I identify with. Mm-hmm. Whereas somebody else might identify with the fear of like, I have no job. I have no yep. savings. I'm going to make it. That's the fear that they operate in. Right. You know, and, and that's beautiful too. Like, and I, I genuinely think that that thing of like operating under pressure came from dance because Ah. I danced my whole life. Like I danced since I was like eight years old and it's like competitive Bollywood dancing, which is a very like weird thing, a very niche thing. But like in college, I was competing for my team. And I don't know, there's like 400 colleges that compete. And every year there's like a winner in this, in this circuit called Bollywood America. And it's like, dude, if talk about pressure, it's like when the lights turn on, like when the, when the initial lights turn on and you're not perfectly synchronized Mm. to the rest of the team in the routine, like you lost single people will lose competitions because it, it, shows the judges that you're not operating like as this, you know, as this like organism and somebody's off. So it's like, if you make a mistake in stand up, at least you get the opportunity to recover. Right. If I flub a line, I get the opportunity to recover. Right. Uh, when I'm dancing, there is no opportunity to recover. There is in the sense that like, you shouldn't screw it up more. And you better right. get your head back in there and like start fixing it or else right. you're jeopardizing everything. Right. And that is an insane amount of pressure. The other thing that kind of uh, bred me for this was spelling bees. Like Ooh. I was doing spelling bees when I was in like elementary school and middle school. And it's like spelling bees are the same thing. Yeah. Spelling bees are the most brutal form of like competitive spirit. Stand up could maybe is competitive. Maybe you could call it competitive. Dance is definitely competitive. Spelling bees are brutal, dude. I mean, I'm thinking of all the kids who are always fainting and, and that seems way worse than stand-up. Stand-up's rough. Dancing's rough, but that's insane. Stand-up's rough because you're making that case to the tribe, right? right? But like spelling bees are like, you're making the case to the tribe and if you mess up in the case, the tribe executes you. Oh, like, you know, so that's, str- I, and, my palms are sweating as you talk. And now, and now let's naked. also let's also add in that you have the emotional growth of a 12 year old. Yeah. yeah. OK, no wonder these kids, these little Indian boys oh, faint, oh, you know, those poor but, things. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I would never have my kid do spelling bees. OK, I did spelling bees because I was like a good speller, but. It's like that was a um, that was a risk environment that Mm. I just did not thrive in. Mm. Like I was scared, like there was no flow state for me. And the reason there was no flow state when I was doing spelling bees when I was really young is that like if I mess up, that's it. The game's over. There is no risk. You know, in dance, there is also no risk. You're doing what has been mechanically practiced and beaten into you over the course of a year. And now it's time to execute on that eight minute routine, kind of like um, the Olympics, you know, like synchronized swimmers. They're, they're practicing all this time for a small, narrow one minute window. You know, I was thinking about that. These kind of one shot divers kind of stuff, right? It's like, that's it. Gymnast. That's it. Yeah. But with stand up, the reason why I ended up falling in love with stand up over all these forms of expression was just like flow that flow state and that risk, that risk state is not only allowed, it's what enables you to be a better comedian. Like the best comedians, I saw Bill Burr at the Roxy a month ago. Oh, oh I saw Mulaney too at the Roxy. Hmm. And he goes, he just 
he had a joke that just straight up bombed, straight up bombed. And he literally told the audience, that's a new one. I realized what happened there. I'm going to fix it. Hmm. And it's like, when I see that, I am so emotionally attached to that level of like analysis. I I was like a couple drinks in, but I felt like crying watching yeah. him do that yeah. because it's like, oh, even at your level, yeah, you you have not sacrificed the soul of of what this is about. You know, like the man, he's coming off of rehab. He's got like a child on the way. He's right. trying to restart a. a, a um he's trying to jumpstart a disgraced reputation kind of yeah and he's trying new bits yeah at the coca-cola roxy yeah like that's brave i have chills thinking what's more that's the most gangster shit i've ever you know i can think yeah yeah um i don't know I, i think that's that's what i that's what makes me so uh happy about stand up and i think As long as I don't lose that, I don't have to be obsessed with who's doing what and where somebody is and how many followers another person has, or I don't have to be obsessed with like, I did bad. I'm a bad comedian or like, I did great. I'm on the top of like that emotional neutrality, I think is, is hidden in that Mulaney type of like introspection and like analysis, Yeah, you know, like it's just math. I always had this thing that like, the, Spoken like a true consultant, I would it's say. It's just yeah. math. Yeah. Stand up is just math. It's like I've always had this thought that's like, if there's a comic who is really, really funny, naturally funny, and is a great storyteller, and that's what that's what they're really good at, that's a good comic. That and that person will always be a good comic. But if I meet a comic who's like deeply intelligent like deeply, deeply intelligent. I'm like, oh, you're a monster. (laughs) Like you are a great in the Mm -hmm. making. Yeah. And I meet, when I meet certain comics where I talk to them for like 10 minutes, I'm like, oh, you're, you could have done anything. You could have done anything that you applied yourself to. You could have been a really successful surgeon and you picked stand up. Those guys, guys and girls are dangerous, dude. Mm-hmm. Like when they operate, they are dangerous. Like you're watching, um, um, you're watching a master because they, like, they had everything to lose. Yeah, but they made stand up the thing, and it's of like, all the things of all the things <laughs> you pick stand up. The thing with the least financial incentive, the thing where you're actually losing money for the first decade, the thing that has the highest risk in terms of whether you make it or not, assuming you're trying to be famous. Right. And you chose that like it's it's a tough world, you know, for everybody else now that you're in there. Yeah. What do Um, you what do you hope or want to get from stand up? Why do you do it? In the end, I mean, I, I see the the day to day sort of, you know, the the challenge of getting better and emotional neutrality. But what's the what's the point? Why do it? I I think, I guess for me, it's just, um, I see these comics who, when I was in New York, they were like coming up, right, or like coming up in the sense where like they hadn't completely blown up yet, but they had a lot of momentum. So like Schultz is a good example or Akash Singh is a good example. Or I remember I was in New York when Shane Gillis first moved there. And when Nimesh Patel got like kicked off stage at Columbia, remember he was hanging out around the lantern too. And it's like, you're watching, I see these the people like that, comics like that, or Maddie Smith, for example, mm-hmm. comics like that who have just taken um, this time in a post COVID world and and sort of accelerated their output and now they're just touring comedians like they just get to do comedy and by that i mean like i'll do shows in like the southeast right and it's like atlanta you know i'll maybe go to like alabama or something like i kind of just stay around here but the idea that i could have like a 20 city club tour and like the tickets like sell yeah is bananas to me like that could be it 
in in the sense that like nobody knows me and I never get anything. A lot of people just default to like Netflix special, bro. Right. Netflix special. It's like, okay, comedy is already like like the NBA in the sense that like who makes it. And now if we're talking about who gets the Netflix special, we're talking about like who gets uh, player of the year or who yeah. gets like, you know, that's like, that can't be about. your career plan. Yeah. yeah. That, <laughs> but just the idea that I could announce like, that I could be in 10 different cities in three months or whatever, or 15 different cities. Yep. And I'm just like doing multiple shows in a city and they're selling. And there are people who are like, I saw your TikToks or like, I saw your And so now I'm paying reels, money. And now see. here is hard cash to view you in person. Yeah. He's just like, it's incredible. Like that is incredible. Um, I also really look up to people who have successful podcasts. Hmm. I don't have one. Um, I think I would really like to do that. Uh, I just don't have like an angle or a, or like a thing I need to say in that format. So I'm just kind of working with trying to put out as much material as possible and as much, as many sketches as possible on social media. But if, if you can be a working comedian, I mean, what's greater than that? Like, what's greater than that? I don't even, you don't even need a lot of money. I don't even need a lot of money. Yeah. Like, if I'm just a working comedian, if, if I'm, like, my, my girlfriend and I moved in together in Atlanta, and, it, and, like, I have this, like, I don't know why I'm getting so, so personal on this, but, um, you know, just the idea that, like, Hey, she's like a, she's like a lawyer. So she stayed in that, in that zone of like very good kid, you know, um, very like passionate about what she's doing and very clear, like I'm Mm. a lawyer, but just the idea that I could be like, Hey, I'm, I got a flight to catch. I'm doing like a weekend in Denver and then a weekend here in Boston. And then I'm going to come back to Atlanta. It's like, like if I were getting on the plane you know, say after saying that, I I would be in comedic nirvana then. Wow. You know, like I would be sitting in the plane in the back in coach. Yeah. You know, and making I don't know nothing. Yeah. To do the shows, barely breaking even, or barely whatever, breaking right? even, maybe not breaking even, but like taking a massive pay cut from an average consulting job. Sure. And I'm sitting in the plane and I'm flying to do shows. It yeah. would be like. Dude, like that's what gets me going. And also, this is kind of silly, but like I really like the idea of my parents being proud of me. Huh. I talked to uh, Osama about that, who's another comic. And we were talking about like what inspires us and like motivates us. And he was telling me that like, um, you know, like he he thinks about where he started and where he is like his personal growth and the risks he's taken to get to where he is or where he derives. Like that's what makes him emotional about his journey. That's where he places the most value is Hmm. what he's done, you know, over the course of X many years. For me, it's like, I have this, like, I have this not vision, but I have this thought that like, you know, that things click in a very real way in the sense where I'm going on many city tours or like you get a TV spot or like a half hour on comedy central or a half hour on Netflix. Let's say, let's go all the way to the top Mm -hmm. and like all the people. And and I've been very blessed. Part of why I moved back to Atlanta because I have a a large community of people who are like helping uh, emotionally. And they're like, like at a certain point as a comedian, you don't really need to hear people be like, you got this. Right. Like, okay. Hey, I don't, I don't need you Kill to it be- tonight, man. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. I, I've heard people be like, you got to stay in the game, man. Like, don't give up, bro. It's like, what? Uh, I mean, who said I was giving up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just introduced that into the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not get, I'm doing this till I die. It's like, Hey know? man, you have nothing to feel bad about. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah. I also have all, all these people who are like, f- maybe they're friends or friends of friends. And a lot of them are Brown people. A lot of them like come from the community that I came from or adjacent communities. And they, um, you know, they, I just see them around the city or I see them in New York when I go up and, and they're just like, Hey man, I, I not, I'm rooting for you. 
Mm. like they're rooting for an underground musician or right. like they're rooting for a team that might not make it to the Super Bowl ever. They right. have that emotional connection to your journey as an artist. And it's like, how great would it be to like put something out at that level, at that mm -hmm. pro level, and they watch it and your parents watch it and your people watch it and the and the people who invested in you early on maybe it was just a kind word maybe it was you know for a lot of people it's true investment like their patreon or whatever but like to make those people happy and to be like you made the right decision mm. backing this horse mm -hmm. that makes me that's a, another goal like it would be nice to like go back to those people and be like, and they're like, isn't that crazy that all this is happening for you? And then I just get, I just get to go, thank you. Yeah. You know, thank you for, for, for being there. And like, for, I think a lot of people lack that in stand up. Like mm -hmm. they don't have that base of people uh, that are like, that are like cheerleaders kind of. And I, and I think if you have enough of those people, like it just makes you feel uh special makes you feel like accomplished and then the way to pay them back is to just be really freaking good at it do you mind if i ask you you don't have to answer how sure. do your parents feel about your comedy now i mean you mentioned growing up with the expectation of being a doctor uh yeah. i don't know that that came from your parents per se but there must have been I mean, there must have been a moment when you said well i'm going to do something different from what i set out to do and and how how is your parents relationship with your comedy and all of that now yeah i think indian kids for for whatever reason i think there is a um there's a lot of weight placed on medicine just generally mm. like indian parents love to create doctors i think they see that as the noblest profession mm. and to some extent i kind of do too like i think being a doctor is a very noble thing it's very passionate uh, you know you have to be very passionate a lot of doctors i know in the same way that we talk about comedy, doctors that I know could be making a lot more money. Hmm. Like I know some primary care physicians, for example, who are just brilliant. And they're like, when I was interning with them or shadowing them, they would tell me like, this is not something you do for the money. Medicine is not something you do for the money. You have to have a passion. You also do get to make quite a bit of money if you right. specialize and you're really good and you open up a practice and you, but all those things come from your passion. Like mm. if you're not passionate about medicine, you will always be a mediocre doctor in the same way you could be a mediocre lawyer and everything. Um, so I think at some point my parents realized that I did not have that inborn passion. And therefore, if I pursued it, success would not be like mm. Um, and, and I think they kind of knew that also I, I had been like performing since I was very young. So I've, I've, um, I don't know why comedians do comedy. I don't know why they like gravitate to like, listen to me. Yeah. And there's a lot of theories out there that like they're broken <laughs> <laughs> emotionally or whatever therapy, et cetera. Yeah. Or, or like they didn't get enough attention as kids or they come from like screwed up backgrounds or whatever. Yep. I just remember like being very young and being like, I would like to perform. Mm. Like I would like to like do these little plays and like um, give these little speeches in like as young as like elementary school. And I just remember being like, this is fun. This is like exhilarating talking to a lot of people and them not talking back. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of like what I've been doing on this podcast, but they, that's the they, point of a podcast. Uh, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. not enough about me. Yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. literally inviting you on. Yeah. No, but, but I, I do think that like, I kind of just realized that early. And so when I, when I made that switch, I think they were also like, they were like a detective, like seeing the clues. You yeah. Know? They were like, Ooh, this, I've known who the serial killer is the whole time. It right. was comedy, you know? Right. That's right. kind of like their, their view of it of like, he's spelling stuff on stage. He's dancing on stage. He's, he's on, this, he's that. And then I, and then I started doing improv and then mm -hmm. like in consulting, the thing I love about consulting is presenting. That's my mm -hmm. favorite thing to do mm -hmm. is Same. to actually present the final product and like 
talk about it and strategize about where to go with it. I love and that so much more than doing the work. <laughs> than doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing the work is like fine. But, it's uh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to be involved in it so you know what you're talking about. But I'm yeah. 100% with you. I love the presentations. Okay, keep going. Yeah. But I was just saying, so the common thread was always just like, there's Zane and there's all these people watching Zane. Yeah. Right? And like, I think that's not medicine. That is not yeah. medicine, you know, and they kind of got that too. Yeah. But I do think, and they're really kind and they're really supportive. And I know a lot of Indian parents who would straight up, you know, not disown, but like emotionally disown their mm. kids if they didn't become doctors and lawyers or they didn't set down that path that their parents had laid out for them. It would be like a huge issue. Uh, I think that's just something that's kind of ingrained in our culture. So I've been very lucky that my parents, um, have been supportive. Like they've seen those clues and they've been like, yeah, like we, we that have your back. This makes wow. sense. Like we're not going to abandon you emotionally or we're going to be there for you. And I asked my mom about like bits, like I'll, I'll cool. run bits by my mom, you know, when we're like on walks together, I'll be like, mom, do you think this is funny? And she'll wow. be like, that is just stupid Zane. And I'm like, all right, that's not a good joke, you know? So we now have fostered that, that relationship where I talk about like stand up, but I do think that somewhere deep down, there's like a, there's like a, um, a line in both of them. That's like, you could have done anything. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you well, that makes you anything. the monster, right? On stage, but they're they're seeing it, right? Oh, yes. Oh, I did. I wasn't even trying to make a callback to that, but I genuinely think that they think, yeah, that by you could have done anything. I mean, like specifically, they go, I guess it, yeah, it is kind of the same thing, but they they go, you would have made a great doctor, yeah, you would have made a great lawyer, and like oh, doctor's the main one because that's what I was geared up to do. Um, but I do kind of feel that of like you really could have applied yourself to anything. Yeah. And is this kind of the thing? Yeah. Like th it's, it's not as much a lack of confidence in being able to do it. It's more of like confusion as to why you're doing it. Like, they're just like, what are you like? What is this? You know? Yeah. Like you kind of have to be, I, I think for any comedian, you just kind of have to be like, I know this doesn't make, especially when you're starting out. Yeah. I know this doesn't make sense, everybody, especially if you're an, an Indian comedian. Yeah. I know this makes no sense to all of you. If you're a bad Indian comedian <laughs> and you're just starting out and you're bad as you should be when you start out. I was bad when I started out. Right. I'm still, I still feel like I'm bad some nights. If you're a bad comedian who's Indian and was raised culturally Indian and you have culturally Indian parents, at some point you have to look at everybody and go, you might not get this, yeah. but I see the destiny, like I see the end of it. And yeah. everybody looks at you like you're insane. You know, when I first started doing standup and I was bad, that was when I was dancing right? And I was dancing and I had announced to the world that I was a pre-med student and I was going to be a doctor. And the dance is something that culturally brown people get. Mm. Oh, Bollywood dancing. Yeah. We see that on TV every single night. We get that. And you're a, you're a doctor. We understand that. We have many doctors in our family, but like with stand up, they're just like, what? Right. Wait, what? You're like, I'm going to also live on Mars. Did I mention? Perfect. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly how they look at you. Be and, it, and it's just because there's no cultural exposure to it. Like, they don't get it. They, I think a lot of brown people think that, like, stand-up in America is, like, <laughs> like mentally unstable people talking yeah. to drunk people. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, they're some not nights entirely inaccurate. Yeah, yeah. some nights you've been to the midnight shows in the village. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I have you know <laughs> and also like my girlfriend being being one of those like type a lawyers you know I try to I don't like to bring her near comedy I, mm -hmm. I that is another um I have these like dumb beliefs that I very much believe but yeah they have they're not rooted in anything but I do think that like if you have a partner who's not a comedian yeah. I don't think you sh they should be around your comedy a lot oh, like interesting. I, I I don't yeah. really like that I, I I wouldn't want my girlfriend to come my partner my wife or my you know whatever right to come to my shows because this is my area to operate in you know but every now and then she'll she'll come to a show because logistically there's no other choice yeah and she'll just be like 
she'll just like watch it. And she's a good example. She might as well be Indian in the way that she like has approached her career and her passion. She is, she comes from that same culture of like, you know, hyper type A, right? Yeah. And so she'll watch it and she'll just be like, she, I feel like she also has that view of like, you could have done anything, but she'll watch stand up and be like, this person is bad. <laughs> like she'll watch it and be like, this person is bad. And I'll be like, no, that's how stand up works. That's a, maybe a newer comic or a comic who hasn't found his or her voice yet. They will be good. And she's yeah. like, yeah, but like, I think what that person really needs is like maybe therapy yeah. and a family that, that loves them. Yeah. They need like love f- and therapy. A friend. A friend. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think uh, to some extent, like when my parents think about comedy, they kind of have that view too. Right. But the, the this, I'm like rambling, but like the, the disconnect is then they look at like Jerry Seinfeld and they're right. like, ah, Jerry Seinfeld. It's like, dude, we're doing the same thing. Right. Right. Like there is a stable functional way to do this too. Yeah. And they're, but they don't see like, a, especially when you're starting out, they see Jerry Seinfeld as like a different thing. Yeah. You know, they're like, you're doing stand up. That's that he's doing. He's not. He's, he's not just doing, doing Seinfeld. Whatever he's doing. He's doing. Si- yeah, that's Seinfeld. You yeah. know, and it's like, no, no, no. This is what this path looks like. And that's the point where you have to be like, none of you get this. OK, yeah. none of you understand why I'm not going to med school anymore right. in the moment. And they go, well, OK, you're not going to med school. Are you good? And you're like, I'm, I'm not good. That's the no. thing. I'm not good. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually bad many nights, but I know where this is going and I can see where this is going, which kind of comes back to that, that um, validation, like that external validation, whether it's a late night spot or a special or whatever it is, that's not really for the person. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it shouldn't be for the comedian. I don't think unless, you know, it is in the sense where it's like, Hey, I'm a good comedian now. And that's great. But I think you should know that before you get a Netflix special. Yeah. Uh, But it is, kind of a token that you're giving you're giving a token to to everybody around you like hey it's real it's also it's real yeah I'm I wasn't insane right I knew I was good at this right you know and and uh I think if you just let the the passion guide you then you can't really screw up like you can't make a mistake um but one thing that I have had to do recently which was really hard for me was to let go of this obsession with fame Mm. I think I had that when I first moved to New York this Mm. deep obsession with like I want to be famous Mm -hmm. it's like a common thing being passed at the comedy cellar is one thing right and that's a great goal that a lot of comedians have and they achieve that and the ones who do that's awesome I'm talking about like when you're watching like Sebastian at MSG and you're like one day I will play MSG it's like I think that might be a sign of emotional immaturity. (laughs) That might be a little bit of a um, neophyte kind of way to view uh, stand-up. Yeah. I will will sell 20,000 tickets in a night. It's like, you probably won't. And you should maybe let go of that obsession, you know, of being the next whatever. Right. just because that's not how it works. But if you if you just couch that obsession into the act and you take all that energy that you spent imagining yourself right. at MSG. The lights and, and the surround and, and everything, how do you play to the people behind idea, you? Oh, that's, that's your obsession with your view as a rock star, yeah. which is what I had when I first moved yeah. to New York because I was very young in comedy. I was like, ah, you know, yeah. one time uh, Nick would make, Nick made fun of me because like when I was first doing stand-up, I'd have a good set and then I would go, Good night, everybody. And he's like, "Why are you looking up?" Uh, he's like, like the balcony. He's seats. like, "There's nobody there at the back he's, of this bar." Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> like, "You're you're you're acting like you're saying good night to the rafters." And I yeah. was like, "Oh, because in my head, that's awesome. I'm like gearing up for this like ultra level of fame." And it's like, dude, that helicopter is around yeah. like the whole. And, it, and it's like all that time that I could have that I that I was that I was fantasizing, especially when I started out about yeah. like being the next Russell Peters or whatever. Right. It's like, dude, now I'm at a point where I'm like, I should take that energy and rewrite the chicken and the egg bit. 
Yeah. You know, or, or like the yeah. vegan, <laughs> vegan liberal bit, you know, yeah. like that, that is the process. And like, right. if you channel it into it, the work, right. And if you attach yourself to the process, maybe you will play MSG, right. Maybe you will not. But I think if you're obsessed with the process and not the outcome, then whether you end up at MSG or whether you end up doing 10 cities in little dingy clubs, right. it won't matter to you. Right. And that's that nirvana. Like right. that's that nirvana. And I would love to get there. I would love to get there. Because right. that would make me, if I got to that point of in, like in terms of my emotional state and my relationship with comedy, it, I could die in obscurity and I would be so happy. That's you liberating know? to think about. Yeah. And, and I think that that's something that I, I really had to like reckon with in COVID. Like I had to be like, when our, when our whole thing got shut down, mm-hmm. I was just like, wait, what is uh, fame? Like, mm. what is my perception of fame? And why am I chasing fame? You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And like, I, I remember like when I was young, my mom would be like, she would see me performing. And one time my mom told me, your soul is hungry for people to know your name. My mom's very dramatic, right? That is a dramatic thing for a it's mother very, She's to extremely say. dramatic. Um, wow. But she would tell me like, I, I think your soul is hungry for people to know your name. And I don't know if your soul being hungry for people to know your name is the right reason to do this. Yeah. I think, or, or money or fans. I think the right reason to do this is like, you want to be good and you want to write a joke and you want people to laugh and you, and it looks so cool to watch somebody kill. It is so cool. It's so cool. When somebody is killing, I'm like, you are the baddest dude or girl on the planet, dude. Yeah. Like that is sick that you get to do that. Um, And that's it, you know? I think this is a perfect segue to existential corner. Are you ready for existential corner? Yeah, let's corner? do it. Let's do it. Let's All right. Do it. So you have one to two sentences. You're also free to skip these questions or answer a different question. Okay. One, what's your biggest regret? Starting late. What is my biggest regret? Um, oh, I'll tell you what my biggest regret was. Uh, was when I was doing that med school stuff. And I, I was kind of like, I kind of told myself until I was 20 that I was going to med school. Hmm. And that I was going to be a doctor. In reality, I had kind of made the decision that I wasn't when I was like 17. Hmm. But I was kind of shutting out um, that reality because I wasn't emotionally stable or ready or confident enough to accept that my path was somewhere else. And I genuinely believe that even at 17 or 18, I knew my path was comedy because I had already started doing improv at the time. And like something clicked in me, like in my heart, in my mind, something clicked in me that was like, this is the space I want to live in. Mm. But I had invested so much time in building my identity uh, to be interlinked with with medicine that I just kind of shut those voices for a couple of years. And then I lost those two years of kind of prepping myself for what I'm doing now. And I had to go to grad school and I kind of had to like, I kind of had to clean up the mess a little bit. And that's just because I wasn't being uh, true to, to me. Right. Yeah. This is not really an existential question, but I'm curious because I also started comedy by way of improv and then gradually got to stand up. What was yeah. your first time doing stand up like? Dude, I did it. at my, So I was a college freshman. I was like a few months at Georgia Tech and my high school was having a stand up night. Mm. Or, or like a uh, like a t- it was like a talent night or whatever, but it was geared around comedy, so it was improv and stand up. Okay, and they were like, "Hey, we've we know you did improv. Do you do stand up?" And I was just like, "Yeah." And they were like, <laughs> uh, "How much time do you want to do?" I was like, "I'll do like twenty minutes. I'll close the show." Oh God! <laughs> you know, and I hadn't written a single joke, and so for the next month, I just wow. wrote uh, twenty minutes, and. I don't, I don't think I'm, I don't think I, I'm not one of these comics who's like, I'm really good. I really don't feel that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I feel the opposite because I think I have to stay in that zone to be better. But that first 
show where I did 20 minutes. I think it's online. I think I kept it up on my YouTube channel. I might have removed it, but somebody ripped it and uploaded it who was at the school and it's like been online for for uh, for years now. But dude, it was awesome. Because it oh because it was I, it I was operate and the set went really well and it was the first time I'd ever done stand up. But I was operating from this thing of like I don't even know what this format really looks like. Like I don't know what this is. And so what I'm saying is the purest form of my thoughts. So I think on a, from like a technical perspective, my jokes weren't good, but I was killing because I was like, this is what I think it is. Yeah. And it was so emotionally pure. Now you're almost in that Nirvana because you didn't even know. Because you were, it's, it's like, it's not even, it's like a skier after years of skiing will be like, you got to hit this jump. You got to do this. You got to do that. But when you're first skiing, you're like, snow. Yeah. Skis. I'm gliding. Yeah. This is great. And then if you don't fall, you're like, I know how to ski. I know how to ski. And that energy, it causes you to kill. This is the reason why, um, I'm sure you've experienced this, but new bits, new bits will kill. Yes. New bits will kill. The first time. The first time. Only. The first time. (laughs) Then the second time, it's like diminishing returns. And Thank that's you. when the real, um, the, the real tinkering comes in. But that if I'm running a new bit, I'm like, I need it recorded tonight. Mm-hmm. It has to be recorded tonight because I need it to be stored for online or whatever, because it's possible that I never get that. Yep. Because not only if I tinker with it enough, I might break it and I'll never have the bit again. I've broken but I'll so many have bits. The tape. Yeah, yeah, I've broken so many bits. And, and it's also like, You give up on it, but if you have the tape of the first time you did it, it shows that the bit had premise, Mm -hmm. but people can feed off of like this, um, this idea that the comic feels limitless. Yeah. And when you're writing new bits or when I first did that 20 minutes, I felt limitless. Did you walk off stage thinking like, this is the thing? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was it. That was it. It sounds like it, you're just you're just seeking that first high, right? Maybe that's what we're all doing. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But but I will say that like I definitely have sets where so those high risk sets that I was talking about, where you're like balancing the risk up, and now if if you keep that risk going and keep that mm-hmm. risk going and keep that risk going and keep that risk going, and it pays off. Mm-hmm. Now we're talking about the same yeah. flow state, that yeah. same energy. Yeah. Uh, so unlike the, heroin, you can get it back. <laughs> you can get it back. You can get it back, but it requires yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. Because it's almost like, you know, once you see what's inside the box, you can't you can't unsee it. Now you're engaged in a right. discipline. So it's over. That first moment of excitement is over. Right. But man, I will never for, and I'm so glad I have it recorded. Ooh. Um it was like you know, it was a little bit uh, hacky now that I look back at it. Like I have this rule now that it's not a rule, but like, I just prefer not to do like, my mom talks like this. Oh, right. My dad, yeah. ha- my dad talks like, I was talking to my dad and my dad was like, blah, 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 you know, uh, but when I was first doing stand up, that's all I knew. Cause I was like obsessed with Russell Peters. Right. Uh, so it's like, when I look back at it, I can't like reuse any of those jokes. <laughs> like <laughs> none of that material right. uh, survived. Right. Um, but that feeling like was so awesome. And I, I remember being like, okay, like getting off stage. And this, I was, again, I was 18 at that time. That was the moment that I should have been true to myself. Yeah. I shouldn't, I should have walked off stage. If I was the person I am now and as old as I am now and as mature as I am now, I would have walked off stage and been like, time to reevaluate medicine. Mm. But I was just a child, you know, I was a child who, who had killed. Yep. And, and it, it was just like, there was nowhere for me to go with that information other than to know in my heart that like, I loved doing that. You know? Right. Right. But yeah. All right. Back to existential corner. <laughs> this, uh, this is perfect. So uh, what is a major fear of yours? Major fear of mine. Um, Okay. I know a lot of comics who like, and this is like in the, in the sense of stand up, 
where they've set these like expectations and these bars for themselves. And a lot of them are externally driven by that external validation. And I've talked about, like, I really do want that external validation, whether that's a lot of fans or a lot of followers or a lot of, or a very successful podcast that brings in a crazy Patreon or a Netflix or what, or a comedy central special or whatever. I'm not, obsessed with that. I'm obsessed with the process, but I'm saying like that outcome, that uh, end result would be cool. Hmm. It would be nice to have that, you know? Uh, But it's not, if I don't get that, I'm not going to be really sad. Um, If I never get a Netflix special, I'm never going to, I'm not going to be like, I wasted my life. Right. But if I get something, I'm going to be happy. If I get to be a working comedian, I'm going to be happy. And that's what I want. I know comics who didn't even get to that. Mm. Okay. And they're older and somewhere along the way they lost themselves and they're very bitter and they're very angry and they're very negative and they've kind of given up on the art form and they've given up on themselves. And I never want to be there. Mm. And that's my fear. Um, I think because it's such a because it's a fear that I carry in my heart and mind constantly, I hope that that's enough to never actually experience it because I'm so aware of it. Yeah. But when I see that, when I see like a, when I see like somebody who is just deeply dissatisfied with themselves and the path that their life took, it's just, it breaks my heart, you yeah. know, that breaks my heart. And like, it just, you, you want to like give them a hug and you want to say, it's okay to stop doing this, you know? And I just don't, I don't want to be that guy. Yep. Yeah. Flip side. What are you most hopeful about? Um, It doesn't have to be your life about anything in the world. Oh, about anything in the world. Yeah. What am I most hopeful about? I'm very, uh, mm, I guess I'll just make this about my life like everything else, but (laughs) I'm very hopeful that like I get to be, uh, healthy and happy and like calm. Like I'm very hopeful. Maybe this is like a COVID thing and maybe it'll go away once things are like completely back to normal and there's less like political tension and there's less like, you know, there's less shit going on in the country, but I really do feel. And so maybe I'm like overcorrecting in terms of like where I want to be because I see things not going so well around the world. but I, I am really helpful or hopeful about the idea of being like uh, happy. Like I, I'm really hopeful that I get to be healthy and happy and calm and like a good person and a good man and a good son and a good brother and a good uh, partner and a good comedian. Like the idea of being better and being really like healthier and happier is like it's so nice to think about that like it's so nice to work towards that and if I ever experience like negative thoughts which I don't know what happened in COVID but I think all the petty shit Mm -hmm. that I had kind of disappeared Maybe that's what happens when like we as a species view destruction and death on a large scale. We kind of see it and we reorient things. But it's like I kind of stopped um, sitting in like shitty thoughts Hmm. and like negative influences. And like if I had a thought that I felt I was indulging a, 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 a bad part of me you know, a part of me that isn't um, trying to be better, I found it easier to like shut that down. And like, I'm really hopeful that I get to keep doing that and like keep trying to be better and more like, um, I don't know, like I'd really like to be a good person. Like I'd really like that. I really like that. And I'm really optimistic about, getting to be a good person. Oh, I love that. You know? Yeah. What's 
this is potentially related, but I don't mean to prime you into thinking it. What's sure. a secret desire for your life? So something you hope for your life that you don't normally tell other people about? Oh, um, I don't know. This is like a tough one, but I think I like secretly want, dude, I think now that we're talking about this, I think I secretly want a kid. Ooh. I think I secretly want a kid. I don't want one now. Yeah. I don't want to have one now, but I think I want to be a good and stable and healthy and happy person. And then I want to like, I don't know, man, because I feel like having a kid might be a symptom of like selfishness and egotism Mm. to begin with. But I think I kind of want a kid. Like I kind of want, I don't know. I would like to, I would like to be responsible for a good person. I would like to be a good person. And I'm very far away from that. And I would like to have a good person. (laughs) I like it. Look, this is not helpful for me to say, but I think you're a good person. And I think you'd be a great dad, which is a weird thing to say to someone. Yeah, no, that's okay. (laughs) I think I I think I'm very young. And I think I'm very far away from like, um, from even really analyzing that. But it started, dude, all this happened because of COVID. I really think COVID, you know, like there were even some things where before COVID, I was like, I didn't like certain people. Mm. I had problems with certain people and I would just kind of like cut them out. Like I would just be like, I don't really want to be near you because I don't respect you or because I don't like you or because you did this thing to me. And now I'm just like, give me a hug. (laughs) Wow. Like it's okay. Like it's okay. Because I realized that all that shit that I was feeling towards anybody or anything is really just a, um, it's just my own shit that I haven't dealt with. Mm. Everything is my own shit that I haven't dealt with. And so I'm hopeful about getting shit out of me, out of Mm. my heart and out of my mind and out of my soul. And um, that's what I'm hopeful about. And, and, And maybe having the kid would, I don't know, maybe having the kid would be an opportunity to like get somebody who's a good person like there with me you know like maybe maybe I don't know I think I think generationally it's a process of like improving upon what your parents did yeah and I I think that's what I'm most hopeful about okay is to be like to continue the generational change of being a good person because I think my mom and dad are better people than their parents were Hmm. I know my dad is a better person than his dad was. I know that because I know about him. Um, And I think I can be a better person than my dad is. And I would like the idea of having a kid that could be a better person than me. I love that. You know? But I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm fucking, what am I talking about? You know, I just want to be clear that both of us are just sitting here talking about this at 2 p.m. on a Thursday. Yeah, and yeah. N- we like maybe we have jobs to do. I don't know. All yeah. right. All right. Almost done with the questions. These are sure, amazing sure. answers. Thank you for sharing all of this. OK, what's something that you're proud of? Uh, what's something that I'm proud of? Um, OK. You know, OK. I'll bring this back to stand up. I remember when I was like first talking about doing stand up to one of my friends, he was like, Oh, so you're doing stand like you want to do stand up? He was like, How far is this going to go? And I was like, I think I just want to be a comedian one day. Like, I want to be like we're talking about, like a working comedian. That's always been my idea. Um, and that's always been the definition of success for me. But he was like, But you're going to med school, hmm. right? And I was like, Yeah. I am going to med school. And he's like, but if you're like a really good doctor, you're not going to be like a famous comedian or like a really good comedian. And I was like, yeah, I guess not. And he was like, and isn't that a shame? I was like, isn't that a shame? Because you are a good comedian and you're never going to do it Hmm. because, because you have, you have, 
and we were very young. We yeah. were maybe like 16 or, or no, no, we were, we were, no, we were in high school. It was when I started doing comedy. So 18 or 19. And he was like, because you've already invested so much in medicine. Like, and I remember having that conversation with him and being like, damn, he's right. Like, I'm never going to get to do it. Mm. Because remember at that time I was still thinking, yeah. I'm not going to be a comedian. Like I, I wanted to be a comedian, but it hadn't hit me like practically. It wasn't going to happen. It, it was wasn't going to happen. New. Yeah. It was a thing that I knew in my heart that I would like to do and yeah. is a hidden desire this deep desire that I have. And I had almost like written it off like a 45 year old man who was like, I Mid-life really wanted crisis. to be a ballerina. Yeah. <laughs> and I never got <laughs> to be a ballerina. You know, you meet those people, <laughs> right? I had had that midlife crisis when I was 19. Yeah. And I remember him being like, dude, you could have been great. He was wow. saying, he was saying <laughs> you could have been great. About the future. Yeah. About the future. Amazing. That's how cemented we were yeah. in this idea of a professional life. Yeah. And I'm really proud of myself for actually doing it. Yeah. And like, however I slice it. And I know I've contradicted myself in the sense where I'm like, I don't care about the outcome, but I'd like the outcome. Right. I think only comedians would understand that contradiction. But however you slice it, I get to do a lot of stand-up. Mm-hmm. I get to do a lot of stand-up and I'm good at it. And that's it. Yeah. And I did that. Yeah. I did that. I get to do stand-up and I'm good. And that was me. You know, nobody held my hand. I bombed for years mm-hmm. and now I'm good at this. Yeah. You know, and I have evidence that I'm good at it. You can go and watch me online be good at this. <laughs> and that makes me so happy because from doing, from being able to do this every night and being good at this, and now let's go back 10 years, a decade ago, I had written off yeah. that this will be this deep hidden desire that I will always carry on my back as an, as a, as a, like uh, something that was never really achieved and something that I left in the dust to pursue a a real thing like medicine. And it's like now fast forward a decade, like I do it every night and I'm good at it. Yeah. Like that makes me, that makes me so proud that like when I open my notebook, I'm like, I am engaging in a skill that I am skilled at. Yeah. That's so cool. And like for people where that answer is not comedy, maybe it's acting. And, and if you can be, if you can do the thing and you can objectively be good at the thing, you're already in rarefied air. Yeah. You're already, there are many, many people who are very passionate about stand up and they love stand up, but they're not good and they don't get to do it and they probably will never get good because of whatever mental roadblocks they have but if you're an actor and you love acting and you're a good actor and you have a reel where you can be like i'm a good it's like Yo, look at me being a good actor like, yeah look we did it it's like yeah. the same thing of like being a kid like look mom look look mom i'm riding the bike with no hands that's yeah. like that innocence is i think if you get to have that then that that makes you feel like, damn, uh, I I made that happen for myself. And there's a long way to go and it might not work out. But as of right now, like I'm able to do this cool thing and I'm able to do it proficiently. Yeah. And that's like awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. And there's a lot of people who get to do, uh, and, and any artist, will get to do something proficiently. Like I I feel that way about my girlfriend when I watch her or when I listen to her, you know, having these like corporate law calls with her team and they're like trying to raise money uh, and they're connecting these startups to these investors and they're prepping for an IPO or whatever. Like, and I listen to her and she's good at it. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, that's cool, man. It's like cool to hear someone be good at something or see it, it or whatever. And, it, yeah. and it's like, I'm proud of her. 
And my brother is like a supply chain, uh, like a supply chain expert. And I listen to him and yeah. he like explains his work to me. I'm like, yo, you're good at this too. And my dad <laughs> comes home and he's yeah. like, Hey, like I got a new gas. I bought a new gas station. Yeah. Like I've got one more gas station in Noonan. I'm going to remodel it. Let's turn this gas station around. Cause that's our family business is gas stations. And yeah. it's like, Whoa, dad. You're good at gas stations. (laughs) Like being good at something is so nice to see in in the world. It is really cool, you know? Uh, But yeah. What's a piece of advice you've been given or you've been given or given that has kind of stuck with you and kind of wormed its way into your head that you hang on to? Um, What's one piece of advice that I've been given? I'm trying to think of like what somebody has told me. Um, okay. Dang. I don't really want to get into this because it's like kind of complicated. Um, we can totally skip it. No, no, we don't have yeah. to skip it. I think it's just this idea of like live an observed uh, life, like live a life where you're like consciously feeling everything. It was like an older comic who had told me like, um, and I've actually heard it a few times, which is like, just be open, Mm. like be open, like don't shut things out. And um, like, if I feel something bad or I feel something good, I think you have to like allow yourself to feel those things, you know, and not like, like, to be honest, when I was younger and I was like feeling, I want to be a comedian. I really did shut that out. Yeah. But I think if you like stop shutting out stuff, uh, especially the negative stuff. So time to time, I do see, you know, social media is just the worst because I can scroll on Instagram and I can see my peers getting things. Okay. And like that little thing will creep its way into your head subtly. You know, Mm -hmm. you might not even notice it, but it will be like why did this person get this thing? Like we talked about, you know? And I think when that happens, I used to be like, you can push it away and be like, nah, 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 get that out of here. Get those negative thoughts out of here. Like you're the right. right. Positive vibes only, man. The rocks, Instagram (laughs) posts or whatever. Yeah. Or you can let it needle its way in and like, you can push it away. You can let it needle its way in and then not really do anything with it. And I think that breeds resentment. And that's what gets you to that like, old guy who's like bitter and old stand-up who's bitter that that's my greatest fear but I think like leading that observed emotional life is like the the thought like needles its way in and then you like trap it right and you trap it I'm picturing like trapping uh cockroaches a a mouse or a (laughs) cat so you trap (laughs) it and you get to go like let's look at you cockroach yeah like let's look at why how did you burrow into this? How did you gross. get here? Gross, <laughs> it's disgusting. so gross. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a good analogy. It's visceral. Yeah. It's like, how did you allow, how did you allow this to enter your thought, right. or your mind? Right. And it's like, let's dissect it and let's think about it and let's figure out what it's bothering that... you for a reason, right? Exactly. What's that reason? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like being emotionally open to the good and the bad to be like, to then turn around and be like, wait, why am I jealous? Yeah. Or envious of this person. Like, it's an, yeah. Why do it's kind I of a nirvana it? on stage, but for your emotions. So. For your emotions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, I think this has accidentally been an entire plug for meditation, even though we've never said the word meditation <laughs> even once in this whole conversation. And I, I really think I need to do that. Um, Same, I tried I it yeah. and I think, you know, this is so messed up, but like I try it and I get into like two seconds of something where I'm like, oh, I'm in a meditative state. And then I just start thinking of bits. Yep. You know, I just start writing in my head and then I'm like, stop. No, don't write this. And then I'm like the vegan, the vegan liberal. Yeah. You know, where do we go with the vegan liberal? And then you're like, I'm not meditating. I'm just writing quietly. Right, right, right. But like Uh, not productively because you're not actually putting pen to paper. So you're going to forget it all. Yeah. So it's like worst of both worlds. All right. Last question. I've kept you all day long. Last question. All right. This is going to be super easy. So don't worry. Um, what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? Yeah. I don't really know. I feel like it's like, um, 
feel like it means different things to different people. But um, I do think that like going back to that thing, like being good at something that makes you happy and gives you like a purpose, the ability to like look back and be like, I was proficient in this thing and it made me happy and it didn't destroy my relationships with people, mm. you know? Cause I think, yeah. I think people have that view of many art forms that like, if it's not sacrificing something with someone, then you're, mm. then it's not true. Right. Um, and I don't think that's true. Uh, so I think if you can, grab on to all these different things and keep them all see I I think a lot of this is rooted in maybe my perception of masculinity you know and like what it means to be like a um uh, and I and it it applies to everybody but I'm looking at it through the lens of like a male Mm -hmm. uh, because that is my lens but it's like if you can have something you're passionate about that you can that can provide um and you have a good relationship with a partner and you have a good relationship with a child if you so choose to have one and you have a good relationship with your family um and you wake up every morning and you're like i care about this thing and i will do it it's like hey you've are you won you won all the things and in reality i don't think it might not be possible to get all those things, you know, like it it might be tough and you might lose one or two of them. And that might just be your destiny or whatever. But like, I think that pursuit, Mm. the pursuit of trying to grab all those things and hold them and, and, and keep them with you is a very noble pursuit. I think that's very noble. Um, And so again, whatever the outcome of that is, is maybe you do go through a messy divorce or maybe your kid, hates you or whatever that could happen you know and maybe you fail as a stand-up or whatever or as a dancer as an actor but the that that honest pursuit was very noble and it was uh it it was very true to like your humanity and i think that's i I think that's what i'm trying to do but again andrea and whoever's (laughs) listening to this i have no idea what i'm talking about yeah (laughs) That's what I have to continuously tell myself is I don't know what I'm saying because I have no real experience. <laughs> like I've, yeah, I've never it was all act- a dream. Yeah. Oh yeah. I should it's tell like, people I've never yeah. actually gone through anything bad in my life. Yeah. That's why I, that's why I can uh, speak with such like, uh, kind, with such serene wisdom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because Things have been pretty cool, buddy. <laughs> it's, it's easy to speak from the top of the mountain when the top of the mountain is very pleasant, you know, yeah, cool yeah, breeze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people Sunny will day. not identify with this at all. And, you know, I think life is going to like probably beat the shit out of me. It might. It I hope not. Will. I mean, I don't know if I hope not. Maybe I, ho- I mean, I, mean I hope you come out good on the other side. If, if yeah, it does. exactly. Yeah. Life has well. not beaten the shit out of me yet. I'm not jaded, you know, yeah. I'm not jaded about stand up. I'm not jaded about my job i'm not uh i'm not unhappy with my relationships i don't hate my parents you know i don't have enemies really yeah uh and um so i'm speaking from a place of like immense uh privilege Mm -hmm. which me in in many aspects which means i don't know what i'm talking about (laughs) so none of this is real functional advice right anything yeah except for maybe my theory about stability and art that's one thing that i think i can stand by Mm -hmm. that like there is a middle ground to do this yes but everything else i'm talking about this like this buddhist stuff (laughs) i have truly no idea what i'm talking about you've never had any bruises you can't get hurt whatever i don't know what they're but these are but these are things that i feel i do feel these things i i was gonna say this even before you said you didn't know what you were talking about, which is that I don't know who to sound like everyone on Twitter. I don't know who needed to hear this conversation or if anyone made it to the end, because I think it's been two hours. I, I found it interesting. I don't know mm. yeah, if anyone else did, but I found it fascinating. And I certainly needed to hear it all because I spend a lot of my time living in one miserable, negative corner or the other, whether it's like I'm not doing enough stand up, whether it's like my relationship, whether it's teaching stuff, whether it's this. Whether, and I'm always just like, 
I'm miserable and I suck and it's all wrong. And it's refreshing to talk to someone who isn't jaded. Yeah. And, and I know you and I've seen you. This is this is more superficial than I want it to be. But I've seen you become a great comedian over the years that we've known each other. You were always good to me uh, as a comedian, but I've seen you become awesome. And it's been great to see. And it helps me, especially in a place like New York City, where I think the, the default is to be angry and upset. Right. And we're all, you know, wish we were doing more than we are. Right. It's awesome to hear you say, like, like acknowledge that you feel proud of things that you've done and have a balance and have stability and have all these things that we have burned into our brains are As anathema impossible. to success. R- yeah. Totally, totally. And I think that's what like a, a lot of modern comics, um, if you look at, like we're talking about Mulaney, right? I mean, yeah. Mulaney... I think we're finding out now that he might not be as stable as his, <laughs> as his external might persona be. was. Might for be. Years. Yeah. He um, looked pretty stable though for a really long time. Yeah, he did. Uh, yeah. But, but you see a lot of these like younger comics coming up or, or like new crops of SNL who I think, okay, here's a good example is like um, Seth Meyers or, mm. or somebody like that. I'm trying to struggle to think about somebody, but I think this idea of like, self-destruction to create self-destruction to create something external i think it's just antiquated i mm-hmm. think it's like going away and i don't think it needs to be embedded in the culture because i think it's been embedded in the culture for a long time things like addiction and broken uh relationships and self-harm and self-hatred and then you create this thing i don't right. i just i just don't I don't buy into that because right. I can't buy into that. Like right. I can't buy into that. I'll right. fail. I know I'll fail if I buy. I into tried that. to buy into that and I couldn't. And I yeah. went crawling back because <laughs> <laughs> it turns out health insurance is a great way to make sure you can think about jokes because you're yeah. not paranoid about this thing growing on your arm or whatever. Well, also then you get yeah. to go to the doctor and you get to write a joke. Yeah. You know, I wrote a joke at the doctor the other day that was like, um, Like the closest I get, speaking of meditation, the closest I get to meditation is when they're taking my blood pressure because Mm. I want them, I want the numbers to come out low and good. And so when that thing is squeezing, (laughs) like my inner monologue is like, you are one with the world. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Ultimate peace. zen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's like, this is life and life is beautiful. And, and then they're like, you're like, what's the numbers? And they're like, oh, it's coming out pretty normal. And you're like, yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just need to like your Pavlovian, just squeeze your arm anytime you want to meditate. Like, oh, oh. <laughs> you buy awesome. one of those. You yeah. buy one of those for, for your meditation. You could get them to have it at home or just go sit in CVS and jam your arm into those things like a creep every day. <laughs> Somebody's like, sir, can we use that? My yeah, 85 yeah. year old father yeah, needs yeah. to check his blood pressure. And you're like, I'm meditating now. Okay. Yeah. This is for like, my, my timer will go growth. up in 20 minutes. So <laughs> I'm listening to like my, you know, my feet are in the sand on a warm beach and all that stuff. Um, all right, Zane, I could talk to you until the end of time. It's been awesome yeah, to no, hang out. Good. Um, and yeah, normally we would talk, you know, before and after comedy shows. So it's been cool to talk like when yeah. it's light out and when we're both indoors and you know, <laughs> whatever yeah. else. Where can people, and I can attest to anyone listening, Zane is super hilarious. Where can people find you, watch you, get tickets to see you if they're in the area or you're traveling to yeah. them? What's um, up? I'm doing a lot of shows in Atlanta. That's just where I live. So if you're in town, um, I post my dates on my Instagram. Uh, I should get a website, but I'm just kind of lazy about it. But you can watch all my stuff on uh, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Um, it's Zane Sharif Comedy, Z A I N S H A R I F Comedy on all those platforms. And I've got like sketches and a bunch of stand up and, and stuff that I upload pretty regularly. Um, and yeah, come out to a show if you're in town and it ends up uh, matching. And I will say, Andrea, that um, I, we haven't gotten a talk like this long ever. Uh, yeah. But we have always talked like this yeah. about these things. If, yes. if a, you remember, because I do. Yeah. That, like, every time we've talked, we've never been like, do you think this is funny? We've right. always <laughs> talked about like life. <laughs> like, and, what are we doing? What is yeah, this? Yeah. And goals. And we do. I am not this existential and abstract in my day to day life. <laughs> but something about hanging out with you makes me that way. Um, but I will say that I see you as one of these Renaissance people as well. Like, well, I you. thought you were again, just a good stand-up. And then I, once I like got to know about all the cool stuff you do, uh, I, I also look up to you and I admire you. And, um, 
And I, I think you're one of these kind of new age creatives that, uh, that uh, I like seeing and I connect to more uh, because I share these, these common views. So I think that's why we talked for two yeah. hours. About, <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah. All but, of this. Uh, but but yeah, you're right. Thank you. Thank you for for saying all that. And you're right. I mean, most of the time I like hanging out with comedians and saying, is this bit funny and whatever. But you're right. Yeah. We would stand outside. And for those who are still listening, we we would bark, you know, in the middle. It was always snowing and it was always February and it was always midnight and the shows were empty. Yeah. And like trying to get people to come to a comedy show and, and talk about like what why we're doing what we're doing and <laughs> what yeah, the point yeah. of it all is. So, yeah. <laughs> For sure. One day we'll we'll get together and run jokes by each other. But uh, yeah. <laughs> until then, I, I enjoy these conversations, too. So thanks for getting existential with all of us. Me too, bud. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, and hey, come to New York sometime. And we'll I will. I'll, I'll be it... there. Uh, I'll be there at the end of February. So okay. I'll stop by the shop and I'll, mess- I'll message cool. you. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Bye. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Majoring in Everything. I'm your host, Andrea Jones-Roy. And Majoring in Everything is a proud member of the World's Smartest Podcast Network. Be sure to check out worldsmartestpodcastnetwork.com and our partner shows. We are edited by Eric P. Stipe, who says that I need an outro, so I'm making one. Eric, does this count? Are you happy? I hope so. Thanks again for listening. Keep majoring in everything. Bye.